Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon. Tony, are you done celebrating your honorary doctorate? I'm Tony Kornheiser. No, just got done performing my first colonoscopy. Oh, really? Who was the patient? A uh, guy in a parking lot. You know, one of oh, the attendants. That's good. Yeah, I thought it was good. I'm sure he was excited. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm sure he was. I was a little bit rusty at it, but, you know, I, I think I did well considering. You know what I mean? You accept insurance or are you a straight cash homie kind of guy? Considering it's an honorary doctorate, I thought I did pretty well. <laughs> Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, oh, the Warriors sweep. Roger Goodell loosens up and the Predators advance to the Stanley Cup final. I told you. But told we begin you. today with tonight's game four in Cleveland between the Cavs and the Celtics. In game three, the Celtics pulled off a stunning upset and held LeBron James scoreless in the fourth quarter. Now, both of us felt that was a one-time shockwave. So, Wilbon, if the Celtics win tonight, are the Cleveland Cavaliers in trouble? Yeah, yes, because if you think you're the best team and you looked unbeatable, you know, in the first couple of series, but you lose two at home to the Celtics after you trash them, then you look, then it looks like Draymond Green was more than right. But he'd be prophetic. And, he, and it would look like the first two challenges you had weren't challengers at all. So I expect... LeBron James to have a triple-double tonight or something damn close to that. I expect him to be dominant. I expect what happened the other night to be the other night and LeBron James to show up tonight. Yeah, I would be amazed, actually amazed, if Cleveland were to lose this game. I would be surprised if they won by fewer than 15 points. I, I just assume from the first quarter on they're just going to start rolling out. I mean, I, so, so I agree with you. If they lose this game, that is actual trouble. Because you yeah. do, because this is well, the Boston's statement game. Well, Boston's got home court back, and it, would, right. it, it might even matter, even though neither one could win on their home floor initially. The way that Cleveland was embarrassed in Game 3, they have to come out better than that. I heard you say that you think LeBron would get a triple-double. I expect him to be in the paint all night long. I don't know if he's going to get 40 points or something like that, but I expect him to dominate the game. I don't know if yes. it'll be statistically, but I expect yes. him physically to dominate the game. Well... You know, Tony, it, I mean, it shows up when, when LeBron is locked in. And, and to me, this is the most overdone story of the entire year, LeBron's one bad game. As if any great player, nobody goes undefeated through the playoffs. No one. No one. I know the Lakers went into the finals one year undefeated, but then I'm sure Shaq and Kobe both each had a bad night. Well, the I mean, Warriors, I saw Jordan have a bad night. The Warriors LeBron are undefeated. can have one. The Warriors are undefeated right now. The Warriors are undefeated now. into. Nobody right. goes undefeated the entire way. So by LeBron's the way, entitled to have an off night. He is. Do you think LeBron will be inspired by the J.R. Smith pep talk to get his confidence <laughs> uh, back? Do you like that? I, I, I'm hearing that. I was hearing that all the way in San Antonio, and I was like, what? Huh? what? Seriously? <laughs> yeah. The Warriors took care of their business last night, Tone. They finished off the Spurs and became the first team to ever go 12-0 in the NBA playoffs. But don't expect to see them straddle the fence like most other finalists when it comes to rooting for their next opponent. Warriors owner Joe Lacob gave voice to this last night when he said, quote, my preference is Cleveland. I feel we have some unfinished business from last season. We were the better team, but they won. We need a chance to go in there and prove that, close quote. Tony, if you were a Warriors player, would you be okay with Lakeup, an owner, saying that? Yeah, I know Joe Lakeup is your boy. You've said that a number of like times. Joe yeah, like Joe Lakeup. Yeah, he's a Lacob. fabulously self-important human being. I have news for him. <laughs> His team was not the better team. No, they were not. No, no Cleveland weren't. was the they better weren't. team. Cleveland won three games in a row. And in a seven-game series, that makes you the better team when you close somebody out. Now, maybe if Draymond Green had kept his feet on the ground and had not got thrown out of game five, maybe it would have been different. But you know what, Mike? Cleveland won, and they were the better team. I think Golden State is better right now because they added Kevin Durant. But Cleveland was the better team. Well, last year, he, 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 of course, Lake was talking about a historic regular season of 73, okay, which, you know, hey, that gets trumped. But, Tony, speaking to the point of whether an owner should say that and how players should feel, I think most times if an owner said that, the players might want to quietly say, what, what is this guy doing? Yeah. I mean, he's writing, he's writing checks out here. Yeah. And this LeBron James. You're calling, let's him, zip it. calling everybody we as if you're playing in the game. Well, but, Tony, I've been with the Warriors for a couple of weeks now. They're fine with it. I mean, Draymond Green told me this on the record in the conversation we had a couple of days ago. They feel like, remember how San Antonio was a couple of years ago, three years ago, really? when they lost, four years ago, when they lost to Miami and LeBron, and all year long, it fueled them, it ate at them. They wanted to come back and play Miami, and they did, and they won. 
Well, the Warriors are in that circumstance now. They're going to get you know, the they chance. They lost that game last year. They've carried this around all year. And the That's players fine. say that openly That's themselves. They're so they going to be fine with They're going to get the it. chance. And let me just say this, that this particular series is going to be a referendum on Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant is supposed to be the difference maker. He's a great player. He's a great teammate. If they lose, if Golden State loses, people are going to look at Kevin Durant, and he's going to have the failure. And if they win, they're going to look at Kevin Durant and say, well, we expected you to win because you're such a great player. Why won't they look at LeBron, the greatest player on earth, nope. if Cleveland wins? What? Because huh? he, was, he was a chess piece in this series last year, and so was Steph Curry, and the new guy is Kevin Durant. Greg Popovich started 39-year-old Manu Ginobili in what Popovich called, quote, a show of respect, unquote, last night. It is widely considered that Ginobili might retire, so this could have been his last NBA game and his last home game as a spur. After the game, Ginobili said, quote, I do feel like I can still play, but that's not what is going to make me retire or not. Whatever I decide to do, I will be a happy camper, unquote. Wilbon, you were at the game. Do you think this was it for Manu Ginobili? Tony, I don't know, because I, I don't think he knows. Remember, last year, Manu Ginobili had to be talked into coming back for another year. I thought this year he played better than last year. I thought there were fewer times this year in Spurs games I saw, whether watching on TV or in person, where he looked old. I mean, Manu Ginobili was, the, was probably their second best player on the court last night. No, I take that back. He was their best player last night. And obviously, they've got injuries. But Manu Ginobili can still contribute, Tony, at a high level. Can he be the Manu Ginobili of 2004 or 2008? No. No, this guy's going to the Hall of Fame. He is a great player with such diverse skills. He's a rare player in the history of the league. But if he wants to play, it would seem to me he could contribute, particularly when the Spurs are having a transition. They're having a transition to becoming, yeah. you know, yeah. a, a different sort of team than they were with Tim Duncan. They need Ginobili for that. I'd like to see him keep playing. I'm going to tell you what gets lost in all this talk. What gets lost is that in game one of this series, the San Antonio Spurs were up by 25 points. Yeah. By 25 points. I mean, against a team that now looks like the greatest of all time, and certainly according to their owner, one of the greatest of all time. And they were up by 25 points, and then Kawhi Leonard got hurt. On the road. The old, On the road that's of right. 25. The old Spurs, Duncan is gone, Parker has been out and is fading, and Ginobili may well be out. But I would not count the Spurs out because of that's Kawhi right. Leonard. If LaMarcus Aldridge not having a great playoff, but he's a good player. And the way they know how to build a team, Mike, you, you, they're not as good as Golden State now, but you never count that team out. It's not like when all these old guys go, they suddenly sink to the bottom. That's not going to happen. No, not with that Tony, team. they know how to draft. Yeah. Their free agency acquisitions are different. They find players who fit what they do. That's right. And they draft late great, like Ginobili, like Parker. Right. Yep. You know, and Kawhi Leonard is a great player. Tony, I agree with everything yep. you said, but it was, I felt, this is going to sound corny, but I'm going to say it, I felt sort of honored to be sitting there watching Ginobili last night. I, I, I just love watching him play. And when Steph Curry held the ball at the free throw line and waited and allowed people to applaud and stand and serenade Ginobili, I thought that was a yeah. great moment. And it told you what his opponents in a playoff situation think of him. As long as we're talking about playing with joy. How about the National Football League doing a 180 on its own sanctimonious, pious behavior and welcoming fun, if you want to call it that, back into Sunday and Monday and Thursday and occasionally Saturdays. Anyway, the league made two rules changes today. The first is to shorten overtime from 15 minutes to 10. The second is to allow, have the freedom to allow players to do essentially whatever they want for touchdown celebrations, Tony, using the ball as a prop, approved. Snow Angels, approved. Group celebrations, approved. Tony, you're a cut up. You okay with all this? This is utterly amazing to me. These celebrations, which were condemned by every single step of the ladder in the NFL hierarchy, are now not only being allowed, they're being welcomed back. They are themselves being celebrated. This is, this is a battlefield conversion. This is like Roger Goodell actually got hit by a bolt of lightning and has come back an entirely different human being. You know why? One word. I know you don't want to hear me say it. But millennials. He's millennials. got an entire... Tony. Millennials. Old people like you and me who paid the freight for the NFL, whether it's through watching television and commercials or buying tickets, and we used to both do that. We're gone. We're not the target audience anymore. Right. He's got to target an entire younger audience that wants this. They don't want it. They, Tony, it's like, the, it's like the soccer, international soccer. Where are the great celebrations now? Where is the fun? 
I know we don't watch, I watch a little international soccer, you watch none. None. But the international game of football is where when scoring happens, which is about once a week. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't the happen. The celebrations are so then, much you know fun, what, Mike, they're over the top. I'm Goodell's okay. Goodell's chasing after that. I'm okay with the celebrations, though I think these are going to become wearisome and they're going to go on and on yeah, and on. Too. I'm, I'm okay with the celebrations, world. but when Roger Goodell says we, to the fans, we know you love the spontaneous displays of emotion, what? He's saying that for years. They loved he's him last year. To they a loved him the year before, and, and he banned them. So, Tony, he's realizing as ratings go down and even the NFL, even just a little bit, he's got a new audience he better appeal to, and it ain't old guys like you and me. The Nashville Predators, your team, became yep. the first team into the Stanley Cup final last night by beating Anaheim and winning the Western Conference final 4-2. Nashville has never been to the Stanley Cup final. Now they await the winner of the Pittsburgh-Ottawa series. Wilbon is hockey hotbed Nashville getting into the Stanley Cup good for the NHL. It's great for the NHL. Really? I mean, from the uniforms really? and the way they stand out and people can identify them versus having an identifiable player, P.K. Subban, who comes over from a lordly franchise and they couldn't win with him and apparently made the mistake of getting rid of him and he comes to a market in the U.S. Look, you can't just go with big markets in the NHL. Half of the league, no, make it more than half the league, can be identified as small market. Even places where they've won a string of championships before, like Edmonton, it's a small market situation. So I think, I think it's a great situation, Tony, for Nashville and for the league. And they need other teams. You can't just have the original six. We're talking about a growing a base and bringing more people into the tent. I don't know. I don't know if they're going to get any ratings at all. I'm, I'm going to wait and see. I just want to speak to something very specific to where I live, Washington, D.C. Uh, a few years back when Nashville fired Barry Trotz and he was welcomed to Washington as if he was the greatest coach in history, even though he had never gone even to the conference finals while he was 15 years in Nashville. He comes to Washington two years in a row now out of his three years. He won the President's Trophy and he still didn't get even to the conference finals. And now Peter LaViolette goes there and gets them to the Stanley Cup final. You know, I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a meaningful statistic to me because everybody he in Washington is talking about Trotz getting did, rid huh? of Alexander Ovechkin. He built, you know, he built on what Trotz, come on, he built on what was there, by the way. Peter LaViolette now, into, he, now he's the first American-born coach to go to the Stanley Cup good, final with three different him. teams. Another attractive thing. Nashville ran into a buzzsaw called the eventual Stanley Cup champion Chicago Blackhawks That's the twice. only reason you're rooting for them, because they beat then Chicago. That's reason enough. You do this that's every year. That's one more reason You are the most predictable you human being the in the universe. Choking Let's take dog a break. Capitals. Coming up, is choking it possible dogs. that LeBron was not or is not 100%? We're going to ask Brian Windhorst. We're also going to ask him whether the Celtics have a legit gripe about the free throw disparity in game trade. So you no, like what, you like J.R. Smith? I know the Nashville's a great city with great country music. You're I don't think it. of it as hockey central. Okay. And Washington is. Pardon the interruption is presented by Captain Morgan. Live like a captain. Please drink responsibly. Part of happy hour. And in part by Advil. Fast, powerful, and proven relief that makes pain a distant memory. Welcome back to Pardon the Interruption, presented by Captain Morgan, part of Happy Hour. In a story we broke wide open in our first segment, the Celtics and Cavaliers meet for Game 4 in Cleveland tonight, which is where we find our good friend Brian Windhorst. Brian, LeBron James had no points in the fourth quarter and 11 for the game. What are the theories as to why he looks so unlike himself in Game 3. Is there any possibility that he's actually injured? No, I don't think so. He was dressed and out of the locker room within about 11 minutes, one minute per point. Uh, wasn't getting any treatment and anything like that. I don't think he's injured at all. Um, there were some great theories, though. One of the theories that I really enjoyed was he was so distraught about not being in the top three of the MVP voting that he wanted to show everybody how important he really was. And I thought that theory was absolute hogwash. And I can tell you, you that LeBron was in no mood after the game. If he was trying to prove any points, he proved the point that he was very frustrated. That was the only thing that I took away from that performance. Fantastic that we're getting a rehearsal right behind you now, Brian. The Celtics won game three, but they had just 12 free throws to Cleveland's 36. That's an incredible disparity. Do you expect that to even out tonight? 
Well, I think that was part. Uh, by the way, did you like this? You thought this lighting was just for me? Yeah. Thought they were just doing this lighting <laughs> for, for my PTI head. That's sweet. No, of course not. <laughs> uh, and by the way, how about this professional ability that I'm able to keep doing this? Um, I think it was actually part of Brad Stevens' game plan to foul the Cavs to slow the game down. Brad Stevens is really smart. The Cavs only had two fast break points in the entire game. That is way, way, way below what they did earlier in this postseason. I think it was Brad Stevens executing a game plan. Wouldn't surprise me if he tries to do it again tonight. Brian, I know you are there reporting and talking to literally everybody. How much stock are you putting into this, this notion that just continues to grow that Danny Ainge is ready to listen to trade offers for Isaiah Thomas? Well, look, I think that the Celtics have a big decision coming with Isaiah, but the decision isn't until 2018. When he's a free agent, whether or not you're going to want to give him a max contract, which these days is $35 million a year, that's a big choice because Isaiah Thomas, as incredible as he is, is limited somewhat. He's limited at the defensive end, and he's limited somewhat in that he can be neutralized at times because of his size. Obviously not all times, because he got the team to the conference finals. But I don't think that's something that Danny Ainge would decide today. I think he'd love to see what Markel Fultz looks like in the NBA and with Isaiah before making up his mind. But I will say this, long term, and you know, I don't know why the Celtics would want to look past tonight, but if you want to, long term, if you think Markel Fultz is going to be an all-star and you could package Isaiah Thomas and the Brooklyn 2018 pick for another star player to put alongside him, that could be something very attractive, and I'm sure it's in the realm of possibility for later down the line. Brian, I, I think I'm right on this. I think that's Cleveland's own machine gun Kelly warming up behind you, and I know that must be a very special treat. We'll get you out on this. LeBron got heckled by a Cleveland fan, and he didn't take kindly to a reporter's question. Is there an element of, of Cleveland that has not yet fully embraced LeBron James? Look, I just think LeBron was in a horrible, rotten, no good, don't bother me mood in game three. And for the most part, LeBron brings it every single night. He's brought it every single night in the playoffs for the last six years. But there have been moments where LeBron has gotten into a mood and you can't shake out of it. It's one of the things he's actually tried to deal with in his career to keep himself even keeled it's a it's a it's a battle he's waged and i thought he buried it i thought this was not something that was going to happen again but it did and so the way he responds tonight and the rest of this playoffs to me will teach you just how much he's matured because he hasn't had a moment like this in a while and his behavior from the first quarter to the post game with the fan and the reporter demonstrated that Thank you so much, Brian. And please tell Machine Thank Gun you, Kelly Brian. how much Will Bond loves him. That's a favorite of Will Bond's. <laughs> nah, I'm a Donna Summer guy. Let's so you know that. Donna Summer. Whoa. <laughs> Let's take one last break, but still to come, Ben Roethlisberger says something surprising. And Calvin Johnson does something that could hint at a comeback. <laughs> Pardon the interruption is presented by Captain Morgan. Live like a captain. Please drink responsibly. Part of happy hour. And in part by Exxon and Mobile Synergy Gasoline. Happy time. People, happy 63rd birthday. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, the second greatest fighter from Brockton, Massachusetts, but only because Rocky Marciano is also from Brockton. Hagler's eight minutes with Tommy Hearns was the Woo! greatest eight minutes in boxing history. Woo! He was the longest undisputed middleweight champ since World War II. And when he was done, he found fame and fortune as an action movie star in Italy. Tony, those weight classes, also including the welterweight division with Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran and Benitez, all those fights were great. All of them, and Hagler involved in a few. Happy anniversary, Bartolo Colon. On this day last year, while with the Mets, the plus-size pitcher, told Nationals catcher Wilson Ramos he wouldn't swing at a single pitch. True to his word, Colon's bat never left his shoulder all night, striking out three times on 14 pitches. Colon is now struggling with the Braves, and there is talk that the starting pitching poor Mets might bring him back. If I was a commissioner of baseball, I would have suspended Cologne for a start. I would say, you know what? If, if you're not in condition to be out there and look and act like a baseball player, get out for another start.
Take a break. And a melancholy happy trails to Cortez Kennedy. The Hall of Fame defensive tackle for the Seattle Seahawks died today at the very young age of 48. Kennedy was the number three overall draft pick in 1990 after playing on a national championship team at the U. He was NFL Defensive Player of the Year in 1992, and he was selected to the Pro Bowl eight Damn. different times. Quite a career. Someone else who entertained us, Tony. Roger Moore, dead at the age of 89, was in more James Bond movies than the great Sean Connery, which is hard for some people to believe. Also in a, a wonderful television series called The Saint. Very handsome, dashing, leading man. The Saint, the Saint was terrific, wasn't it? Yeah, wonderful show. Let's, uh, let's go to the big finish right now. Let's do it. The Hawks will interview Chauncey Billups for the GM position. Is that a good fit? Well, I like the fit he has now, getting to work with him, and Chauncey's great. But yes, it will be a great fit if the Hawks or somebody hire him as a GM. Ben Roethlisberger says he's 110% committed, quote, like I said I was, close quote, to the Steelers in 17. Is that how you recall it? Tony? No. He advanced the possibility that he was going to retire. He did it. His words. What? Sheldon Richardson of the Jets implied that the team's locker room would be a lot stronger without Brandon Marshall. Are you surprised? I'll roll with Brandon Marshall and his productivity anytime. Ian Rappaport reports Calvin Johnson is going to attend the Raiders OTAs as a special guest. What are you reading into that? Maybe he wants to come back. they got a hot quarterback, Derek Carr. They might be a Super Bowl team. You would want to play on a team like the Raiders. Last one, Pens can close out the Sens tonight, will they? No. The Senators hold on. They extend the series at home. Ottawa, Tony. Ottawa over your Penguins. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, knuckleheads. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. Mitch Album, happy birthday. PTI.